We are back with another episode of the Do As I Say, Not As I Did podcast. And the name explains everything. We're going to give you advice on what we did wrong the first time. So each week I bring on different founders or investors or product experts, technology futurists, sales gurus, just anyone who's really smart and can help us work out how to build a great business. And then together, that expert and me answer questions to help you on what's going on in your business right now. So people write questions in, we workshop them together. You get a bit of my advice, but mostly you get advice from someone who's really smart. So if you do have questions and you want us to workshop them, send them through to podcast at joeldietrapani.com. I know that that is a huge mouthful of a name and you probably can't spell it off hearing it. So I'm going to include that in the show notes. I'm your host, Joel Dietrapani. I have a, a long name, but also I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Vigo which is an edtech scale-up. We've grown it through Australia and the UK, and now I've moved to the US and I'm focused here completely. On top of that, I'm an advisor and a coach in the product space where I help startups and businesses work out how to build great product teams because that's how you build great products. And I made a lot of mistakes doing that the first time and I'm hoping to share a lot about you know what to avoid when you go on that process yourself. And today, I'm so excited to be joined by Mike Knapp, an incredibly smart product thinker. Currently, Mike has built Currently, Mike is building Mottle, which is a platform that helps you build chatbots in 10 minutes with no coding. Before this, Mike was a product lead at Google and co-founded the experimental Google product Taskmate. Mike also co-founded Shoes of Prey, a startup he helped scale massively to a valuation I can only imagine was in the hundreds of millions. In the middle of all of those projects, he was also the entrepreneur in residence out of the accelerator I did when we were early on in our journey. So I'll be forever grateful to have had Mike and to have Mike as a mentor in my life. So I'm so excited to introduce him to, to the audience here and get everyone a bit of a picture into, into how my product thinking has been shaped as well. On top of all of this, Mike has also created uh, courses for aspiring product managers and currently has a blog that I love because it's honest and vulnerable, which makes the content really powerful and relatable to your own life. Mike is an expert at building products and at product management. So let's jump into it. Welcome, mate. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for having me. I should I should point out we never reached the hundred million dollar uh, valuation. That she's a prey. I'm, I'm fairly certain. Uh, okay. But <laughs> yeah. still, you know, even in that realm is insane. <laughs> <laughs> it was, a, it was um, a fun ride for sure. Yeah. Gosh, I I, I remember when I first met Mike. I uh, he came to this speak at a university i was like attending startup classes there and mike spoke and then after that i just kept hitting up mike on all of the different platforms to, to try and meet him i was like i need this guy to be my mentor i don't know if you remember this mike but at the time mike had, had built this this other platform which was about meeting uh meeting random people and, and sparking like conversations with with new strangers like as a way to form human connection but I figured because Mike had just released it, there was a pretty good chance that if I signed up to his platform, I could meet him. So I just kept going through and meeting as many people as I can until I got matched with Mike. And, uh, and that, was, that was the first way I met you before you know, I met you through Isn't the right? entrepreneurial residence. Yeah. Wow, that's super cool. <laughs> that's, uh, I, I go to a lot of lengths to meet people sometimes. Probably yeah. bordering on not okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but mate, tell us, what are you working on at the moment? Um, at the moment, I'm doing some freelance development work um, in addition to Mottle. Um, so yeah, at the moment, I'm building a AI journalist, which is really, really Ooh. fun. Yeah, can't really talk about the project much more than that. But yeah, it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting project. And I'm really loving what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah, right, there's, a, there's a lot in the gen, gen AI space that, yeah, to explore. If people want to find out more, subscribe to Mike's blog and you will... Uh... And you'll get updates as he can share more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, current currentdraft.com is the URL. Awesome. All right, we'll put that in the show notes too. So let's jump into it. Attention. <laughs> Interrupting today's conversation because I have I'm back to tell you even more about our sponsor. This podcast, your favorite podcast in the world, is officially partnered with Miro. Now, Miro is just a simple, basic digital whiteboard. Not. <laughs> did you do those jokes as a kid? I did, and I wasn't ashamed of doing them as a kid, but, but I am ashamed that I'm doing them now. Anyways, Miro's capabilities run so far beyond the digital whiteboard. It's a visual collaboration tool that my whole team uses and your whole team can use to build on each other's ideas to create something meaningful together from anywhere in the world. 
Not only does Miro bring all the people into one place, but it brings all the information by bringing all the softwares you use together into one place as well. So no matter, no matter what stack you use to run your projects or run your company, that can all come together into Miro to allow for real collaboration with all the information you need. Now, look, every freaking week, I'm just getting thousands of letters, physical letters from my audience saying, Joel, we love your Miro ads. They're a favorite part of your show. We like them even more than plugs. Um, and this is definitely true. I keep getting tons and tons of letters, but what you all want to know more than anything else is how do I actually use Miro? Well, look, I've heard you. I'm going to tell you, so just relax enough with the angry letters. So here are my five most recent Miro boards that I used last week. These are just the titles of them. One, travel plans. So I'm traveling to, tra I'm planning to travel to Australia right now. I've got all of my travel plans for that trip all planned in Miro. Second, company OKRs. I'm going through an OKR resetting process. I'm using Miro for that as well. That one's not just me. I have a bunch of other people coming in and contributing to the OKRs. Third, as I've explained before, I use them for the board meeting prep. So I just ran my board meeting last week. All the board meeting prep and, and even the board meeting was run through Miro as well. Fourth, startup city index. This is actually just the Miro board that I'm playing around with myself. I have this idea which defines the quality of a city for startups and it's a bell curve. <laughs> That's all you need to know. Anyways, I'm using Miro to actually flesh my ideas out in more detail and I use that a lot to get my thoughts clear. Uh, and then the last one, number five, is that we're designing out a new feature right now. It's a functionality we like to call ecosystem light and we've just been messing around in Miro about you know who's this for, what are the pain points we're solving and what's actually gonna be. So that's five examples of how I've used Miro this week. Um, and yeah, I love using it for uh, for almost everything that I do in my week to week. So get Miro today. When you sign up, you're gonna get your first three Miro boards free forever. It's not gonna time out. If you mess around in Miro, you'll just have that for good. So sign up today at miro.com slash podcast. And because I talk fast and with an Australian accent, that's real. <laughs> I promise my Australian accent's real. Uh, I'm gonna spell it out. So it's M I R O dot c o m forward slash p o d c a s t mirror.com slash podcast all right let's jump back into the questions question number one this is called how do you defend your roadmap from leaders i work in SaaS that has a hardware component high growth company been here for one and a half years and it feels like i can barely get to an mvp or product or a feature before the leaders decide in a company level strategy change it makes it difficult to argue the value of my roadmap because we're always moving to the next enterprise checklist feature to deliver. To that end, it makes it difficult to demonstrate any impact that I've had over that one and a half years. Have you been in this situation? How do you reclaim your roadmap? This is from Last Elephant. Hmm, interesting. So I haven't actually been in this situation before. <clears throat> um, other than to say I've been in the situation where I'm the leader in a company and I'm changing the roadmap constantly. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> um, at Google, I was very fortunate because I was able to develop my own products. So I pitched this new product and, and I, we won this pitch competition and we were able to like build a team and, and then we basically ran our roadmap and ran our dev team ourselves. Um, so that was great. But at Choose a Prey, definitely we were, as leaders, we were changing we would call it the, the shiny object syndrome where, <laughs> you know, we'd read a book. I, I would famously read a book or, you know, one of the founders might go to a conference and, and we'd say, okay, let's, let's change the roadmap. Let's go work on this other thing. Now everyone drop what they're doing. And the staff were actually pretty good at pushing back on that and saying, Hey, look, last week you said it was this, this week you're saying it's that, which is it. Um, yeah. And so we got really good at, um, having these company wide OKR planning sessions. Um, and Todd, who was the product manager, so Joel, some others, they were really good at getting everyone around the table and <clears throat> uh, brainstorming together, almost having like a design sprint for the roadmap or the, the company plans. Um, and then giving everyone voting dots to actually vote on what we should be doing. Um, and after doing that for a bit, uh, you would start to see that your ideas as a leader weren't necessarily shared by the rest of the company. And they had a lot, often had a lot more information than you did. 
in terms of what we should be doing. And so getting around a whiteboard and hashing that out was a good way to get the leaders to see that, hey, like, yeah, actually maybe you're, you're steering the ship in the wrong direction. We need to, um, as a team, decide to go in a, in a different course. Um, so yeah, that was pretty effective in terms of getting us to stop reacting to this like shiny object syndrome um, yeah. constantly. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think founders, at least early founders, like they just have shiny object syndrome. It's why they did a startup, you know? Like yes. it, it's it's what can get, help get off the ground and that in those early days, you're so, you're rewarded so handsomely for having that because you need to be able to chase momentum. But mm. as a founder, it is very hard to transition away from that because changing an intuition for a long time is the only thing that can work because you can never have enough information to really understand where to go properly. Yes. But but it sounds like, you know, this company is getting to a point where it's almost becoming detrimental and they're going to need to go through that shift. And and I think a strong kind of leadership team around the founders is actually really important to that. And I know mm. having having a strong product leader in my own company has has really, you know, dampened my shiny object syndrome to some extent and that's because they're, they're making it, it like, like you're saying Mike like I need people to push back against me and I find that really effective you know I, I don't I don't care about being right I care about doing the right thing <laughs> I just often mm. think that I'm right at the beginning <laughs> so I need people to to to, to push back and, and explain that so I guess for us OKRs is really important Oh, OKRs are really important as a as a way to achieve that, or some kind of like larger goal setting mechanism where mm. you know what what you need to do for three full months and six full months and twelve full months, and and you can change within that. But if like high level strategy is constantly shifting all the time and there's no consistency where your product can get past an MVP stage, and you and you can't see product value in a year and a half, that's like a that's a that's a pretty big issue in my mind in a startup. Like mm. it's, a, it's a pretty good sign that you don't have product market fit and you're not necessarily moving towards product market fit either. Mm. Uh, I, I think you need... So I guess if I was in Last Elephant's position, I would I would start to really push for a, a clearer roadmap which fits with longer-term goals and, and start to, you know, just make up those longer-term goals. They don't need to be correct, but if, if you can take those larger plans to the founders and show them how the product needs to feed into that, how the product's shaping that larger mission, that larger strategy. That's one really important element. And the second is to just tell the, tell the founders that they have shiny object syndrome and make it really clear the impact that's having, that you can't make progress as a product, which is why they're going to constantly have challenges as a leadership team mm. and as a company. One, one interesting thing about the question is that uh, he, he talks about like like chasing enterprise features as the alternative to what he's working on, and I assume it's a he, um, maybe a she as well. Uh, that that's very interesting, and, and and I'd like to maybe dig into that a little bit more if I was in their position, because it could be that that the the company is really on a brink of collapse, and the founders don't want to be super transparent about that. But there's a you know there's a lot of anxiety about landing and, and keeping these enterprise customers to keep the doors open, um, and so you know if if I were in their position, I think I would want to be a bit more curious about what's really driving the founders to make these decisions, and 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 listening to them and sort of trying to understand what the business problem is to be solved, because it could be that my MVP actually isn't really that important that, that, that actually we need to be more transparent with the staff more generally around, Hey, we've got limited runway. We need to hit these revenue goals and we need to do a whole bunch of short-term stuff, you know, for the next six to 12 months to stay alive. And then after that, we can prioritize like longer term things as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think digging in and understanding. Yeah. Like, be... I, I, I guess, I think that's very much like, <laughs> a dire lens, which, which sounds like it could be true. Like, I, I do think that's one reason people trace enterprise, but also there's, there, there's maybe a chance here that you just are an enterprise software. And, and mm. I, do, I do see a lot of product managers and a lot of product leaders fight against that. You know, like the, the, the cool product managers do B2C. They do like consumer stuff. 
Mm. And it's about like high levels of user engagement. But, and like that's that's definitely happened to me in my business. You know, I've gone through phases, even mm. though like we are an enterprise software. We, we serve end users at the end of the day, but we're an enterprise software and we need to add a whole lot of value to that enterprise. And for a long time, we had this like internal debate where we were fighting like against mm. where the company, what, what the company was and what, you know, like this idealistic view. And that, that made the roadmap constantly change because we kept saying we're going in one direction, but the most important thing was, our, you know, the, the growth and the value for the people who were buying these big contracts that we, mm. we needed to provide. And that caused this big, I guess, like tension and, and like, gap between what we did and what we said we're going to do which made it seem like that but Mm -hmm. then when we started to realize who we were serving and what the value was we created for them it didn't feel like our roadmap was so sporadic anymore it felt like it Mm -hmm. it kind of all aligned for us because the product team understood the company's goals and yes and and i do think that alignment is really key and it felt like for a long time, you know, like my co-founder Ben was like, we need this enterprise checkbox now. And I was like, no, we need this like consumer grade thing. And us constantly fighting between us would put tension on the rest of the team. So I I guess like one question I would ask is what Mike's saying is like, are you on the brink of collapse? And maybe you are and you actually need to win these win these six or 12 months worth of clients and then you can move back to what you're doing and that's completely fine startups go through ups and downs but the other one as well is like are you actually a better fit as an enterprise software and should you be building for enterprise which Mm. is actually a different kind of product leadership you know Mm. you need to think about it differently and balance balance like the weight of things differently too Mm. i think it's implicit in the question too is something around incentives so uh, i think the question said something around um I don't know how I can show impact because I, yeah. you know, the things that I'm working on can't, um, can't launch. And I, I guess that's something you want to clarify with the leaders because it sounds like it's very clear what they want you to do. It's like deliver the enterprise features for whatever reason. Maybe it's just that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a cash flow issue or it's just that that's the core business and maybe you're getting distracted or, um, or yeah, maybe they're not seeing things clearly. But certainly there has to be a discussion around, you know, what is my role, as you've said, for the next six to 12 months? And then like, how can I show impact? And then how is that going to affect me um, as a as an employee um, yeah. in terms of my grade and pay and so opportunities for moving up? Yeah, I, I think that's a piece of advice that everyone in every role in every company should really deeply understand with their manager, which is that what do you expect of me? Because when it's really clear that what success looks like in your role, you could mm-hmm. like you will achieve more of what the company needs because you know what you're aiming at, and you're also going to give you, yourself a whole lot less anxiety too, when you're when you're just hoping that it's going to make your boss happy or the leaders happy or you know achieve the goals that you are guessing are there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, uh, and to be honest, that's not something I I'm particularly good at or enjoy. Uh, I think yeah, I've decided that corporate corporate life isn't for me, and I'm going to be a indie hacker from now on. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so good luck good luck with that but yeah i think i think talking about it definitely with the leaders is the best way to approach it and and not to take an us first them uh approach which is sort of implicit in the question a little bit it's more around being curious and and trying to understand i guess where everyone's coming from and then listening to different opinions getting those opinions around the table and then trying to make a decision together as a team and move forward yeah it, it's about alignment here and like you know the, the title of the question is how do you defend your roadmap from leaders and, mm. and really at the end of the day, if you're leading the product on behalf of your company, your roadmap should be achieving the company's goals. And if it feels like it's not, like if it feels like you're constantly defending it because like either your leaders are coming up with shitty ideas and, and that needs to be addressed or your roadmap isn't facing the right direction for what's important right now. Whether mm. that is, you know, you need six months of enterprise clients to save the business or, or whatever. So... I guess if we bring this down to a final judgment, if I'm if I if I try and simplify everything we've just gone through, Mike, <laughs> it would be I understand what the company's objectives are, and then align however possible your roadmap with those objectives, and and have those conversations with with the leaders or with the founders about why they're changing it. You know, either it's a short-term enterprise thing, it's a long-term enterprise thing, but, but line up with what you're doing to create real value to push the company forward. 
Uh, then secondly is understand what they expect of you personally as well to, to kind of reduce a whole lot of that anxiety about like, am I providing value or not? Taking off enterprise features probably is, especially, you know, if the company's on the edge, very valuable and you and you doing that is uh is going to tick some boxes off there mm. when, when um final thing for me is uh i would i would hesitate to call a roadmap your roadmap i would i would start calling it our roadmap uh and i would try to get alignment as much as you like as you've said joel from everyone because i think implicit in the question is that this is mine i need to protect it yeah but i think you need to like open that up and say this is not be so sort of anxious that you're not going to get credit for this but actually bring people together and and, and create that alignment that's really your job um, a really influential book in my career has been maverick uh, written by a guy called ricardo and i forget his last name um, but he ran a factory in brazil and he has a very unique perspective on getting the factory workers to be uh, sort of participate, I guess, in, in, in making decisions. And he was very anxious in, in sort of giving up control. Um, but he found that people really surprised him uh, with their creativity and their passion. And, uh, and, and they would often uh, go above and beyond, you know, when he would give them um, opportunities to, to make decisions. And so I think that's, that's, for me, has been very inspirational in terms of how I've led teams, which is to say, it's not me making a decision that like, let's, let's all make a decision together. Um, uh, particularly in my, yeah. in my last role at Google, I think that was something that I, I was quite proud to implement. Yeah. I think that's a great approach, especially in product, you know, like, like when, when you're building for the future of the company, you, you need the buy-in there from everyone, like from, mm. from the people who are actually doing the building to the people who are implementing up to the leaders who, who are defining it. it yeah, the, the roadmap is a tool to push the company forward. It's it's not it's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, it's it's not your cool ideas that you need to get done. You know, it's it's your job is to help achieve company goals and get the yeah. money from, from all over. Exactly. Actually, um, uh, during COVID, I, I took up improv, and if I think I think all product leaders should try improv at one stage. Uh, it's it's fantastic, and. There's two really funny rules about improv that I love. One is, um, if you don't know who the asshole is, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> and number two is, forget all your shitty ideas. Um, so w in improv, like there are just you know two people on the stage usually, uh, and you have to work as a team. You have no other choice. If you try to be a soloist. In improv, it, it will be terrible, and the audience will hate it. So you have no other choice but to look another human in the eye and and make decisions together, whether you're sort of verbally communicating that or non-verbally communicating it. Um, and you have to basically release your mind of any like preconceived notions that you had about what the scene is. Um, it, it is the best product management practice that you can have in terms of giving up uh, your ideas and really collaborating with someone else to build something together. Um, That's good so that, advice. But mm. adding that to the final judgment, you know, <laughs> get, get alignment with Take what the company point. goals are, make your product roadmap in alignment with that. And it's, it, it's the company's roadmap. And lastly, is take up improv so you can learn how to give up control <laughs> and, and to give up these ideas that you're holding onto too tight. Wonderful. All right, last elephant, you've been advised. We're, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna close that one out. We'll move on. This next question uh, is called Roadmap Template. Do you have some good examples for product roadmap templates? I know, of course, there are tools from Atlassian for this, but the less fortunate PMs among us, I think there is probably other product templates available. How do you do a product roadmap? From Pluck49. Mm. This is actually something that I hear people talking about a lot. You know, I think product roadmaps are this like somewhat elusive thing. And in my mind, it's because I think people see them as a, as a rigid, like a, a, I guess a, a rigid set of rules. We will do these things on this timeline or mm. your roadmap has to be in ex this exact format. 
And I know when I was first learning about it, it really overwhelmed me. But I, I hear about this a lot. And, and you've you've now been, Mike, in like the from the smallest product dogs to the to the biggest product dogs. I'd love to know how you think about this. How, how do you think about a product roadmap? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I guess it, it definitely depends on the scale of the project. That's the first point. So if you're a two person startup, yeah, you probably don't want to have a very formalistic, um, or any roadmap. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not true. You should have some sort of idea of where you're going, but yeah, you wouldn't be planning it with like a lot of granular granularity because you're going to learn a lot. Um, I can tell you kind of roughly how things worked, um, on my team at Google. So we would typically Google is start with a, a PRD, uh, product requirements document. Um, but, but even before we get to the PID, we would do a lot of user research. So that would involve, uh, uh, for me, I was very fortunate to go all around the world, um, and go into people's homes, uh, in different countries to sort of understand how they were using the internet. And then we would also do street intercepts. So people like completely random people, we just approach on the streets with a translator and then talk to them about how they're using the internet, look at their phone if they gave us permission to do that. Um, and that was really, that was wonderful. I love that. I love the research part. And then from there, you sort of get insights that then feed into a product requirements document, but also you're working with a, a UX person as well. And I was fortunate to work with uh, an amazing UX lead at Google. Um, and so we, it would always be sort of a collaboration and, and often she would do some of the road mapping and some of the product requirements documents. I would do some of the user research sometimes. So we, it was a very sort of fluid thing. It was a bit of a partnership. Um, but we'd also involve the team. So we would, we would do these design sprints where we would get the whole team together and we'd review all of the research. And then we would do um, some brainstorming, some crazy eight drawing. We put it all up on the wall and we'd vote for what we thought was the most promising. Um, and that, and we would just talk about it. And from that, you would often get a few different ideas that we'd want to work on for a few months that were clear winners. And then the, the design team would go away and work on some designs. The engineers would start mocking stuff up and, you know, the PMs, we might, we might write a, a document to sort of formalize the requirements and so forth, but it wasn't. It wasn't me handing down a roadmap from a pulpit saying, this is what we're going to work on. Go and work on it, please. It was a very collaborative effort. And it we didn't really even have a written roadmap. We didn't need to because we just sort of all talked about it and we all knew kind of what we were working on. And because we talked about it and we all sort of decided, we were all so much more bought in to the process. And we didn't have to sort of have a formal document. It's like, you know... <laughs> On May the first, we'll start on this feature, and then on you know April, and here's the ticket, here's the Jira tickets, and we, it didn't really work like that. It was more of a collaborative effort, and that's the way I prefer to work, which is a more. But but your organization may not support that kind of uh, workflow, and maybe you do need a template. Um, but I, I wouldn't start with a template. I'd start with a discussion with the team, and I'd, I'd I'd get everyone's thoughts and opinions out because even if you don't ultimately take their advice or go with their opinions they'll feel listened to and they'll feel more bought into the process and they'll they're more likely to go and do a good job and implement all the things that you've talked about i i love the consistency of your message mike which is just that like use the creativity of your team get buy from your team talk to them you know you don't have all of the answers and you're not expected to either you, you know you hire smart people for a reason you build a team of great people for a reason. So, so capitalize on use everyone to to their to their fullest. You know, get mm. like and and help them grow in that as well. And and, and I think everyone will have more buy-in. You'll you'll achieve more. I guess for me, I, I if I take a step a little bit back and, and I guess a, a little higher on roadmaps in the way I think about them, mm. is that I think you know roadmaps are a tool to help you stay on track to achieving what your product's purpose is or what the company's purpose is. And those two things mm. should very much be the same. You know, what is your company trying to achieve in the world? Your product does that. And, and your roadmap is just like physically the steps you need to take to achieve more of that larger goal. Mm. And I think some people think about roadmaps so granularly 
which is just like, we need this task followed by this task followed by this task. And when you're thinking about it from that bottom-up approach, you often miss that larger level there. So the, the kind of like template, I'd say we work on at Vigo is it's like, I guess it's maybe our product strategy, but it, it's kind of all links together for us. Is what we have, what is our company's mission? For the next six to 12 months, what is our product vision? What does our product have to become in 12 months to achieve our company's mission? Mm. And then underneath that, we just have five pillars like or four pillars whatever it is like what are the what are the key areas of the product and the platform that we need to work on over the next six months to achieve these companies goals maybe it's better enterprise capability maybe it's better conversion maybe it's we need to implement ai for scalability like what are the the top level things Mm. um that that we know if we work on these we're going to have like, everything we work on should hit one of these buckets. And for us, that's a way to say no to work as well. Because, you know, you get, mm. as companies grow, you get so many requests. Mm. And for us, we, we have this framework, which is, is it in one of these buckets? No, then it's actually not important for us right now. We can push this one to later. And, and mm. it's like, it's a clarifier for us. Then it boils down to the actual roadmap. And we just have a really simple roadmap. It's what are we working on now? What are we working on next? And what are we working on later? And, and roadmaps don't need to have all this level of granularity for, for every single business. They don't need to have exact dates on everything. It, it just, we use this as like a prioritization system that we're constantly coming back to, which is that we have this new project that the team kind of works on through user research, like you're saying, Mike. And like, here's this big list of really cool stuff we want to work on. What's most important to bring in next? Mm. And we're constantly reviewing that against that pillars, against the, the top level of our company. But, but I know that leaders are always fighting to have better clarity on what's coming up. So that's, you know, that, that's also one useful part of a tool. It's not just for your team to work out what you're doing, but as the rest of the organization needs to know, where's the, where's the company going as well? And for us, we just give really clear advice, which is roadmaps are like weather forecasts. What's coming up in the next seven days? Yeah, we, we know. Like if it's going to say it's going to rain on Thursday, it probably will. But, you know, if you look a couple months out, I don't know, you know, Maybe we know what the weather's doing. Maybe <laughs> no, we got some confidence on it. But when you're looking, you know, for 12 months out, you know, summer's hot and winter's cold. And that's why we think about our roadmap. Up close, we have a lot of confidence down the track. This is our best possible guess. But as we go, it should shift as we get more information. Mm. So that's why we, we use roadmaps. It, it's, it's a tool to kind of clarify what we're working on and make sure it's, it's the right stuff against what we want the product to become. And then it's just a bit of an ordering system to be like, if, if everything stays as we know now, this is the order we will work on stuff. But as we go, features work and they don't work and we need to change them and we get, we get new user insights mm. and stuff like that. So it, it's constantly shifting, but, but I think they should be dynamic and they should have permission and, and reason to change. Yeah, no, that's a good way to look at it. And uh, we would have a deck that sort of did something very similar. So we would start with the vision and mission of the project we would have the uh, the core, like the, the, the eventual state of the product that we wanted to get to. We'd have the customer profiles. Um, we would have the OKRs, and we'd have sort of the feature, like the sort of now, later, maybe <laughs> yeah. sort of buckets. Um, and, and we'd have that in one deck, so it was kind of easy to digest like the whole project in, in, at a glance. Um, and for me, that was enough. Like, you know, that, that, that plus talking to the engineers and talking to the customers regularly and constantly like processing the, the stochastic information that's coming from the product and, and the market, you know, you, you're sort of, you're sort of steering the ship with like imperfect information, but you know, yeah, if you're present in, in your business and you're constantly um, watching everything and, and, and talking to people and you'll, you'll, you'll know what's coming up, you know, uh, next and. And then in a few yeah. months' time, like you said, I like the weather forecast. I think that's a good way of, of thinking about it. I I say that maybe twenty times a week. I, it's my favorite. <laughs> I didn't make it up. Someone said it to me. I can't remember, so I can't even give them credit. But yeah, it's now mine. I've copyrighted. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, look, we'll, we'll we'll close that one out. We'll bring this one to a final judgment as well, which is uh, think about your roadmap in in as simple ways as you can. You know, it, it, it's a it's a guiding tool. It's a guiding principle. So I, I love having it in a deck format as well, Mike. So, you know, create a slide deck. 
keep your mission and your vision like what are the objectives of what you're trying to achieve and any kind of clarifying information you need in there the okrs the metrics you're achieving what you want your product to be the the product pillars the way that you know how to think about where the product's going and then keep your product very simple your, your roadmap very simple which is what's now what's next or later and what's you know down the track as, as it may be and, and let that be dynamic let that be fluid and constantly change that as you get new information and and as mike said you're, you're driving a ship with imperfect information on the terrain so that's totally fine just just know that and make the decisions with that in mind all right uh pluck 49 you've been advised well look we've uh we've gone pretty in depth on those questions so we'll actually wrap this one up here and uh mike there's so many more questions i want to i want to ask you because you've got such good um i love the way you're thinking about these questions and and, and you just ask so many more questions on them that, that i think too so we'll get you back on for another episode at some point in the future so if you've got That'd more questions for mike send them through and, and we'll get it back on but uh we'll close this one out here and uh we'll move on to the to the fan favorite section plugs so what's going on mike what's uh what's going on in your world what do you want to plug um uh, nothing specific to plug uh other than my blog if you want to check that out that's that's um that's cool uh well, I don't know if the blog's cool, but that would be cool if you checked it out. Cool. Uh, <laughs> CurrentDraft.com. Um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Um, right. I'm really loving, like, just learning about AI at the moment. Um, I just bought a new computer, an absolute beast, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I can muck around with, like, AI models at home. Um, so, yeah, I'm just, like, watching a lot of YouTube and, like, reading a lot about, you know, how to, how to get all this stuff set up. And learning about windows again for like the first time in like 20 years so <laughs> that sounds tough yeah <laughs> well we're it's gonna plug mike's bad. computer <laughs> so <laughs> nice your computer plug stuff. currentdraft.com i love it subscribe i'm gonna put that in the show notes too and check out model too it's really fun um you know create a chatbot in 10 minutes with no code and uh if you want to learn about ai just because we're talking about it check out matt wolf on youtube i love matt wolf on youtube He's the ultimate AI influencer. He's he's awesome. Um, it's the, the in my mind, it's the go to stuff for AI content. He's 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 funny and the content's great. I'm gonna awesome. put him in the show notes too, probably, unless I forget. And uh, on my side, um, thank you to everyone that writes in. We absolutely love these questions. They're they're really fun to work through. Um, I I love having them. So if you've got some got some you want us to workshop, uh, send them through and we'll put them on the next pod. Send them through to podcast at joeldutrapani uh, Also. I love meeting new people. I love chatting about this stuff. If you've got challenges in your business or you just want to talk about, you know, product ideas or AI or anything, book some time with me. I've got my calendar link in the show notes as well. So, you know, I love meeting new people. And and if you've got product questions, I love talking about it. So this is what, whenever I call Mike, this is the kind of conversation we have anyway. <laughs> so yeah, um, lastly, subscribe, like, five stars, any podcast platform. Get your phone out right now and hit like and subscribe. Get your friends' phones out your parents phones out strangers phones out like and subscribe <laughs> on those as well it's the best way to show support and we're going to wrap this one up mate thank you so much for coming on uh i love arguing and laughing with you uh, i really enjoyed the conversation <laughs> yeah, this, has been, this has been another episode of the do as i say podcast we'll see you next week